Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't know how good this will come out because sometimes the glare of the sun gets on it and I can't see. But this is just going to be a quick video because there was a question and answer that was uh, a question that was asked on my question uh, and answer intro video and that was my what are your, my thoughts. It's almost like someone's trying to bring in maybe they're sincerely asking about flat earth versus globe earth or maybe they're trying to cause trouble. I don't know but I, I'll say this. I'm not doing a huge study because there is no way to do a huge study. I've watched people who do studies on Flat Earth. I've watched people who do studies on Globe Earth. And a lot of it is going off of science and feelings and opinions and the verses that you grab. Some of them sound good for Globe Earth. Some sound good for a Flat Earth. But sometimes the scriptures are being taken out of context. One of the biggest ones I hear about the Flat Earth, they'll turn to the scripture where it says the Earth is his footstool. But that whole saying has nothing to do with the flat earth. What it's saying is, is God's above the earth, ruling the earth. Nothing happens without God's permission. He's in charge. That's what it means. I mean, you think about a nation. This nation goes to war with this nation and says, let's make this nation our footstool. It's saying they want to rule over this nation. It's not talking about a flat earth. It's saying that God Almighty rules the earth. He's in charge. He controls all things. If something happens, it's because He allowed it. That's why the Bible tells us and teaches us that we need to be patient and that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. God's got a plan. That's what that verse is talking about. And they totally destroy the whole point of that verse by trying to say that that teaches a flat earth, and it doesn't. Now the point I'm making here is I've watched videos that um, make good arguments for a flat earth. I have when it comes to science and what we see and what's going on. I've seen good videos that talk about a globe earth with true science. They're really good videos. But here's the thing. I've also seen videos that I had to laugh at the, how pathetic it is that they're trying to des desperately say the earth is flat and instead of just sticking with the book and with true science, they throw something out there and I go, that's, that's not true science and I have to laugh. And the same thing goes with the globe earth. You had people trying to do the globe earth and they weren't taking into account um, the distortion from the heat on the water, on cement. They showed a picture of a guy walking on, on a sidewalk and it's a long sidewalk and then the heat radiates and as the guy's walking towards him, the guy slowly disappears like he's walking down and he's not. It's a mirage. And they were trying to use that to say it's a globe earth. I understand that. You use things that but my point is, is there's pathetic arguments on both sides. And there's good arguments on both sides. But here's what I'm going to say, brothers and sisters in Christ. Does it change anything in the Bible if we have a flat earth? No. It doesn't. Does it change anything in the Bible if we have a globe earth? Now don't get me wrong, I don't believe there's galaxies, galaxies, galaxies galore. The Bible talks about, we look up in heaven, this car going by, um, we look up in heaven and God's gonna, it's gonna roll away. Kind of like that veil in the temple that was rent. There's gonna be a veil up in the sky and it's gonna be rolled away and we're gonna find out heaven's right there. God is right there. He's been watching us the whole time. There is no billions of galaxies and everything. God's right there. But can we have a round earth and God still being right there? Absolutely. Could it be a flat earth? Like I said, I've heard good arguments on both sides. Okay, talks about the four corners of the earth. Um, I mean, uh, there's been good studies. Brother Brian put out one about it being a globe earth. And then I've watched some studies on flat earth and it's like, okay. My whole point is, is it's not worth arguing over. I'm not going to sit here and beamly go, it's flat earth and I'm going to get into a fight and a debate like it's, it's life or death. Brothers and Christ, that's, don't do that. Okay, don't do that. It's not life or death. Flat earth, round earth, doesn't change the Bible. Doesn't change the doctrines. Doesn't change the instruction of righteousness. Doesn't change Genesis chapter 1 all the way through. Because sometimes I forget. I think it's 22 chapters in uh, Revelation. I always have a hard time turning. It's actually 22. Yep, 22 chapters. So... Revelation 22, Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, globe earth does not change anything. Flat earth doesn't change anything. There are fights that are worth fighting, like fighting for the
King James Bible being God's perfect written word and standing for it. That's a fight worth fighting for. It's pathetic that the brethren are getting so bent out of shape. Flat earth, round earth, flat earth. And you just see them bickering like little two-year-olds over something that they can't prove in Scripture. Like I said, there's good things in Scripture. There's a few verses that kind of make it out like there's a globe earth. And there's a few scriptures in here that make it out kind of like there's a flat earth. But the scriptures aren't clear because we don't see as God sees. Now, if somebody can show me that I'm all for talking about it. I am all for talking about it. But you have brethren out there bickering over it when a good fight is, this is a good fight. This is God's perfect written word. All the other Bible perversions are Catholic Bibles, proven Catholic Bibles. Okay? You're either a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, or you're a Catholic. There is no in-between. There's no non-denominational. There's no Lutheran. There's no Baptist. There's no Menon uh, I was about to say Mennonite, but uh, Methodist. Uh, no. You're either a Bible-believing, God-fearing man, you have God's perfect written word in your hands, which is the King James Bible, proven time and time again. Remember, like I said, I could go into the fight, but this is a fight worth fighting. 99, over 99% of all Greek manuscripts back this book. It's absolute truth. Less than 1% back all the other Bible perversions out there, including the New King James. They try to mix this with the Texas Receptus with the Nestles Alon. Okay. This is a good fight. This is worth fighting for. Flat earth, round earth. Brothers and sisters in Christ, got to grow up someday. What I see is a lot of new Christians get really sucked into it. And I'm not trying to be mean, but I see them get sucked into that fight. That's not a fight that's worth fighting. This is. The true plan of salvation. You look out there in the world and they're preaching another Jesus, another gospel, getting people to receive an antichrist spirit, another spirit that we read in Corinthians. Paul's warning about that. So what's a good fight? Standing for the true plan of salvation. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. What's true biblical repentance? For godly sorrow worketh repentance and true salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. You need to come to God broken, having sorrow for the sins that you put on Jesus Christ at the cross. You specifically, not the world as a whole, you specifically, your sins are why he had to die on the cross. You don't come to him broken and true biblically repenting, you didn't get saved. They always try to change repentance. It's unbelief to belief. So since it's unbelief to belief, we can just take repentance out and just say, believe, only believe, only believe, all things are possible if you only believe. True plan of salvation, that's worth fighting for. The belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ, I did a study on it and I had these easily believisms attacking me. We talked about it, brothers and sisters Christ, about the no changed life gospel is a resurrectionless gospel. It's proven in Scripture. The old man is dead and buried with Jesus Christ. The new man is raised with Christ. If there's no new man, you're denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ with the life that you're living. And this easy believism, oh, I want to keep my sin and I want to live like the world and look like the world and just call myself a Christian. You're not saved according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, it says you can believe in vain, but you read the whole chapter, it's talking about how they are forgetting the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they're denying it with the life that they're living. And if you're forgetting it and denying it with the life you're living, God's, Paul's like, check whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. If a man be called a brother, if a man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, old things, all things have become new. Old man's dead and buried. You got a new, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Victoria. <laughs> Sometimes she hears things. But brothers, that's a good fight. Standing for the true plan of salvation. Confess both in prayer. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth salvation is made, or confession is made unto salvation. Unto. You have to confess your repentance and your belief in Jesus Christ. You don't confess every individual sin. You come to God as a sinner saying, Lord, I am a sinner. It was because of my sin that you had to die on the cross. I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner, Lord. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I deserve to go to hell. Lord, save me. I believe 
that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. I believe that it was God's blood that was shed on the cross. I believe he's your son, son of God. That his blood can wash my sins away. That he died and was buried. How he died, the blood. How he died, that was buried and rose again the third day. Lord, please save me. It says in there, call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. Lord, save me. You have to ask him. You don't deserve it. And when you have people out there trying to take prayer out and take and asking God to save them out, it's called, they're going about to establish their own righteousness and their pride is still there and they're still on their way to hell. Because they refuse to drop that pride and say, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. That's a good fight, brothers and sisters of Christ. Uh, dispensationalism, that's a good fight. There's dispensations here. The number one reason why Christians are so messed up today that uh, they get saved, and there's so many false converts more than anything, more than the messed up Christians, a lot of the false converts, is because dispensationalism. They don't know how to rightly divide. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing. Dispensationalism, that's a good fight. Uh, eternal security in this dispensation, they're always going to accuse us, brothers. When we tell them that you can lose your salvation because they're not dispensational, when you tell them that they can lose their salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble, because the Bible says you can, you take the mark, you worship the beast, you, when you die, you go to hell. There is no forgiveness for that. You do that, you're toast. You can be saved, born again, have the Holy Spirit, and then lose it and go to hell to burn for all eternity in the time of Jacob's trouble. Not today. Thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. You can lose it and get it back. You can lose it and lose it, period. Okay? But for today, in this, what we call the church age, from the death of Jesus Christ, because that's when the New Testament comes in, at the death of the testator, it's in the Hebrews, the death of the testator, to the catching away of the body of Christ. It's eternal security. When God saves you, the Bible says you are sealed into the day of redemption. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. This teaches when you get saved, when God saves you, you're saved. You're sealed. And the day of redemption is the catching away of the body of Christ. That's a good fight. Um, Pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ. The Bible teaches God will not pour out his wrath on the righteous along with the wicked. God's not going to pour out his wrath on his own body. The Bible teaches that before that time happens, we are caught up. He who now leth will let until he be taken out of the way. We are hindering that time period from starting. The body of Christ will leave in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Okay? This corruption must put on incorruption. This mortality must put on immortality. We're going to be caught up. Dead in Christ shall rise first and start heading up. And then we get changed and we start heading up. There will be a catching away of the body of Christ at the end of the church age. There was one when Jesus was raised. There's one for the church age. The, the, the full resurrection has three parts. The, the catching away. The full resurrection, catching away, has three parts. It happened when Jesus was raised from the dead. Three days later, the dead in Christ came out of the tombs. He led captive captivity. They went up. The second part is at the end of the church age. The third part is at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. And when all three parts are done, then you have the complete resurrection. That's why it's called the first resurrection. But all I'm saying is, it's a good fight. I'm not going to be here for the time of Jacob's trouble. That's a good fight. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, my whole attitude on it is I've seen good I did, I've seen good things on flat earth, I've seen good things on round earth, but bottom line, I don't care. It doesn't change anything in the book. I'm not going to get and spend hours and hours debating and arguing and talking about flat earth over round earth when it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. Okay? It's almost like when you go to another thing, because I know I wasn't asked this, but you go to Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then there's a period, and people say from that period, there's a gap. Now Peter Ruckman, I listened to Peter Ruckman talk, and it's just like, really? Some people get puffed up, knowledge puffeth up, and I'm not, I love brother Peter Ruckman, 
but it seemed like he, he's been ministry for so long, he has to have the answers for everything. He's got to have the answers for everything. He'll say, I don't have the answer for everything, but here's your answer. Oh, I don't, I just want you guys to know I don't have the answer for everything, but here's the answer. Okay? Now, here's the thing. I agree and disagree with Peter Ruckman. There's a period there, absolutely. Is there, a, is there a gap there? This is just my theory. And it's just a theory because God, we'll find out when we go to heaven. Is the gap theory something to argue over? It is when they say there's billions of years gap trying to promote evolution. You're a Satanist if you're doing that. You need to stop doing that. But it's one thing to say, eh, there might be a gap there. There's a period. Well, why do I say there might be a gap there? Well, let's see. It, what does it say there again? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. One of the big misconceptions is, is that Satan, they believe Satan's an angel. He's not. Notice the stars haven't been created yet, but the heaven, heaven has been created and the earth. Okay? Heaven. So I look at it, and like I said, I can't be 100% on this, but that means the throne was created. What, four, what five things were around the throne? Cherub. You have the four cherub around the bottom of the throne, and you have the one cherub that was above the throne. Somewhere between chapter 1, and then we see Satan come down into the snake and tempt Eve, somewhere along that, or actually before Adam was created, before Adam's created, and chapter 1, somewhere along the lines, Satan got puffed up. He was the anointed cherub above the throne. He got puffed up and thought he could be equal to God or even above God. I'll be like the Most High. Somewhere along that line, something happened. And he fell. Was there a little gap there? Long enough for Satan to get puffed up, maybe. But when, when Adam is created, man was created to replace him. That's why, that's why Satan hates mankind. He hates mankind. All these people that worship Satan, oh, he loves me. He, he hates you. He hates mankind. We were created to replace him. We were created to give God glory in all things, to give him thanks, to worship him. Uh, Satan, before he was a fallen cherub, it talked about him having instruments and gems on him. We always, it never says he was in charge of worship, but he had instruments, and he was above the throne. Okay. Yeah. We were created to replace him, and he hates that. He hates it. Okay. So, even with that, am I going to sit there and argue with people? No. I, I make my little, like I said, my two cents. Somewhere along those lines, there was some time that Satan fell, and God decided, I'm going to create man. Okay, he already knew the future, but there's a difference between God knows the future and God's will. God knows a lot of people are going to go to hell, but God's will is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. People need to understand the difference between the two. God's knowledge is infinite. He knows the future. He knows what's going to happen. But some of the things that happen, it's like, my, I didn't want that to happen, but he gave mankind free will. And from the look of it, if Satan was able to fall, he gave the cherub free will. If a third of the angels come down and sin, then he gave the angels free will. Okay? So, but is that worth arguing over? And getting into debate and, then, and having such contention like, I think it was Barnabas and, and Paul, such contentions as they had that you go your separate ways? No. There's some things that's like, God will show us when we get to heaven. God will tell us. I'm not going to make a huge doctrine out of a period. That's the part that really gets me. I'm not going to make a huge doctrine out of a period. God put a period there for a reason. Absolutely. Absolutely. But are we going to get so bent out of shape? Like I said, I have yet to have hear any good arguments. I listened to Peter Ruckman's arguments about how he believes there's a gap there, a huge gap there. It's like, uh, you're, you're fishing, okay? You're, you're guessing, in other words. You're seeing something that you don't understand, that he doesn't understand, and simply saying, I don't understand, he's trying to understand. And he got messed up, okay? But like I said, was there some time period there? Maybe. But brothers and sisters in Christ, for this question and answer, Stick to the stuff that is important. The Word of God. Absolutely. 
but stick to the fights that are worth fighting for. This is God's perfect written word. I'm holding on to it, and I'm not letting go. King James Bible. Well, you do know what's got to say? No, it doesn't. Every, every attack on this book has been asked and answered. Every attack. I might not know all the answers, but there's books out there by brethren who have studied the Bible version issue. They have suffered all the attacks. Pete, Brother Pete Ruckman has some books out there. Uh, I don't like supporting King... Uh, um, not King... I don't like supporting... Because uh, I do have some books. I don't support Sam Gipp anymore. But the answer book that Sam Gipp had had to do with them attacking with a lot of questions. And he answered them. Praise the Lord. But I don't support him because he's kind of fallen away. Present tense. Past tense. Present tense, I don't support him. Uh, David Daniels at King James... Or at uh, Chick Publications. I keep thinking of James Ministry. At Chick Publications. I don't support him. Present tense. His, his gospel tracts have gone over to Easy Believism. They've gone over to uh, Childhood Conversions. He's making a mess of the scriptures because he's got to keep coming out with new and new and new stuff. I also got on to him about the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the image of the Godhead and we're not supposed to draw Jesus Christ. We got on to him about how angels don't have wings. Why are you promoting a lie? If you're about absolute truth, David Daniels, if he ever watches this, why do you promote lies and deception knowing it? Because he'll admit yeah, angels in the Bible don't have wings. Then why you promote it? See, I can't justify someone who's purposely deceiving people. Purposely. And then the new Bible that he came out with, the Spanish Bible, he started rendering some of the uh, renderings in that Bible don't line up with the King James Bible. They line up with the Bible perversions. And he's trying to justify it. So I can't present tense support him. However, past tense, back in the day when he actually truly loved this book fully and completely and wasn't compromising with the world, he put out some good books defending this book, answering a lot of the attacks on the book, Bible. Okay? That's a good fight. This is my book. Nobody's taking it. Nobody's taking it. This is God's book that he gave to me to take care of, and now it's mine, which is his. But it's mine, but it's his. Okay? That's why you take care of it. More than anything, it's His. Why? Because when it belongs to somebody else, when you're a good person, when you have something that belongs to somebody else, you take care of it. It's not mine. I need to take care of it. Are you take caring this book? Take caring of this book. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Are you hiding this book in your heart? Do you know this book like you're supposed to know it? So you can know what fights are worth fighting for and which ones are just like, okay, it's just a theory. Uh, was one of the disagreements I have with Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries is the uh, 24 elders. It says that there's people up there from every tongue, every nation. That includes the Jewish people. That includes the Jews. Every tongue, every nation. He believes it's two from each of the t uh, 12 national boundaries on the Gentile side. I believe there's 24 total boundaries. Because that's what the Bible teaches. There's actually 24 total boundaries. 12 on the Gentile side, 12 on the Jew side. I can't be hardcore about it. I believe it's one from, there are 12 of them or one from each of the Gentile na national boundaries. They're an elder. You can't have two kings ruling the same area. Okay, so you got one. And then you got one from each of the 12 tribes. That represents all 24 boundaries. Am I right? I don't know. We'll find out when we get there. Is Brother Brian right? I don't know. We'll find out when we get there. Is that something worth fighting over? No. It's not. It's something that worth talking about. You know, we can talk about it, try to go through the scriptures, and we keep it about our love for the Lord. Absolutely. But is it something worth debating to the point of arguing and bickering like little children and going our sep throwing our temper, tan temper tantrums and going our separate ways? No. It isn't. We'll find out when we get there. There's a lot of things in here I don't have the answers to, Brother Jesus Christ. I don't. Okay, someone asked me way back, I think it was a few months ago or probably longer. I'm bad with time. Um, what about the Ark of the Covenant? Where's the Ark of the Covenant today? I don't know where the Ark of the Covenant is today. Some people believe that Jewish people found it and they're hiding it and waiting for the right time to unveil it. Or it might be a counterfeit. I mean, who knows? I mean, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. All right? So there's things in here uh, that catch away the body of Christ. When I told you how I 
think that the more I study it, the more I realize that the moment, the blink, the twinkle of an eye is when we go from incorruption, or, I'm sorry, from corruption to incorruption. Okay? I believe that we're going to be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. But the catching up is going to take some time and it's going to be a big event that the whole world's going to see and it's got to be explained away. Peter Ruckman teaches only, save, only the saved get to see it. And everybody just disappears like that. But the Bible doesn't teach that. Now, am I going to tell him he's 100% wrong? Well, in the sense, I don't know. I, I, I stick with the scriptures. Until somebody can make a really good, solid argument comparing scripture with scripture with scripture, I hope I did, because everybody in the Old Testament to the New Testament, they got caught up. And when there was somebody around to see it, they saw something. It was an event. Um, they took their clothes, and the blood went with them. Because Peter Ruckman teaches that blood gets left behind, and I, somebody else tried to jump in and say, blood gets left behind. It's like, listen, when... Um, uh, the first guy, uh, Enoch, when he was caught up, I was like, was there anything left behind? Well, we don't know. Yeah, we do, because it says, for he was not, for God took him. He's just gone. Now, I don't think he's gone, like, just vanished. I think he got caught up. Everything. Clothes, blood, everything. He could have been changed and then caught up. I don't know. But maybe there was nobody around to see it, but when they went to look for him, he's gone. There's no evidence. When it says he was not, in other words, there's no evidence that he's there. He's gone. What happened to him? He's gone. And then someone finds out, well, God took him. That's what happened to him. He, he just seemed like he disappeared, but God took him. Same thing with Elijah. He went up. Blood wasn't left behind. He's got to come back down and die a second time. Uh, he's one of the two witnesses. Moses is going to die twice. He's one of the two, uh, two witnesses in the, in the time of Jacob's trouble. But Elijah goes up. When Jesus went up, what was left behind? Okay. Only one time was the body, was the blood left behind. And that's when Paul talks about being caught up the soul, like death. If you die today, this age as a Christian, your soul gets caught up. The body and the blood gets left behind. All that gets left behind. But the whole point is, is, it's not worth arguing over. When it happens, it'll be glorious, and that's all I care about is that it happens. I know it's going to happen. It's just when it happens. I just care. I want it to happen in my lifetime. Peter Ruckman wanted it to happen in his lifetime. Okay? But it's not something to fight and argue over. I'm not going to get up. If Peter Ruckman was alive today, I'm not going to get in his face. Where do you get at with blood and this? Because I remember the verse he uses uh, where it talks about flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And... But I'm not going to get into his face and get into an argument. If he wants to talk about it, say, okay, I see your point. I see a little bit of brother, uh, Peter Ruckman's point. If you want to get together as a brother and to brother to brother, get our heads together and what God has shown us in the scriptures, and let's go through and do a little bit of a Bible study on it, I'm all for it. But to get into a big fight and a debate over it? Now, there's some things that just aren't worth it. It's, it's, we have to be, how do I say it? We've got to be bored. Some of the things people argue and debate over, when it comes to the Word of God, it's like, I feel like you guys got to be bored. There's nothing else you guys can be doing for the Lord. And one of those things is flat earth versus round earth. You guys are bored. You got nothing else. You can, There's so many other fights to be fighting that are worth fighting. That fight's reprobate. It's worthless. All right? It's worthless. It's reprobate. You're not going to get any rewards for that. We don't know. I, I, don't, I, I cannot see the whole world like Jesus sees it. God manifests in the flesh. He's up there in the throne right now preparing a place for us. In my Father's house there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Okay? He's up there looking down. God's looking down. He sees the whole earth. He sees His creation. He knows how it's created. It's not worth fighting over. Now, I didn't mean to go around and beat around the bush a little bit, but brothers and sisters Christ, there's good fights, and then there's people trying to pull you away from the good fights. Trying to distract you from the good fights. Trying to get you away from what's important. Okay? Don't let them do that. Okay? Stick to the important stuff. Make sure you stay in this Word of God and make sure you know this book. It took a lot of time for God to help me with this book and there's still a lot I don't know and there's still a lot that I'm learning. Okay? And I'll be studying this book and trying to know this book until the day I die or until we get caught up and we all get the mind of Christ. 
I can't I look forward to that day. I want that day. You know, part of me wonders, another little side note, part of me wonders when we get the mind of Christ, is it going to be like we're going to be standing there and it might, to everybody around us, it might happen in a second. But to us, are we going to get to walk around with the Lord? You know, just, it's weird. I know it's kind of weird. But we get to walk around and ask the Lord anything, everything, and He answers all our questions. Or is it just something that's going to be instant? We got all this, all this information comes in and we just know. I don't know. But someday we're going to have the mind of Christ. All our questions are going to be answered. All the, the debates when we shouldn't be debating. Um, but all the disagreements and everything, God's going to set the record straight with the body of Christ. He's going to someday. And it's going to be a great day. And I look forward to that day. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and remember to fight the good fight. Fight the good fights. So I'll see you in the next video.